All right. Thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, I'm Alex, and our our guest today is Mr. Max Weekly. Uh, he is an avid birder um, and a blogger. He does have his own blog. It's called Max Bird Facts, where he shares photography tips and birding tips alike. And it is very, very informative. I really recommend that you go check out his blog. He'll he'll probably have a link to it in his presentation. Perfect. Thank you, Alex. Uh, all right. So let me get the screen shared and we'll get this presentation started. Okay. Okay. So welcome to the Backyard Birding Series. Uh, this is about nesting season. My name is Maxfield Weekly. I'm the Vice President of Marion Audubon. So when is nesting season? Uh, here in the Northern Hemisphere, it's in spring. So that's March through June. The overall peak is April through May. So we're entering into it right now. Uh, winter nesting is fairly common for resident populations. Uh, and those residents rarely nest during the equatorial migration season. So that's during the spring and fall migrations. Uh, they don't do it just mainly based off of uh, extra competition for food and for spacing and then increased uh, predators in the area for raptors that are going into uh, South, Central and South America during the uh, winter and then back up into the Americas in the summer and spring. So why is nesting season in the spring? Uh, big reason is the temperature. We're leaving winter, we're entering into some warmer climate. Uh, this is allowing for uh, a little bit easier maintenance of the young. Uh, they're able to not freeze at night when the temperatures drop. If it wasn't the very early spring or in the late winter, rain is another big factor. We start to get more rain further into spring than we are. Uh, and then those two components, the temperature and the rain, give us food, which is what all the little birds need to grow. So like the purple martin in the center image, and the red-bellied woodpecker and the uh, far right image, they're both carrying invertebrates, which are pure protein. And for some of these birds, they're having to go from hatching to uh, fledging within a couple of weeks, maybe a month at the best. Some of the larger birds take a lot longer, but these little guys are very, very quick growing. So how do you find a wild nest? So you've got to know the species first. Uh, if you don't know what species you're looking for, you're probably going to have a hard time finding the nest that it has. Uh, you got to spot the key behaviors for nesting. You have to listen. Uh, anything with birding has to do with listening. If you don't have your ears open, it's going to make it a lot harder to find uh, the nest that you're looking for. Inspect trees. Nests are in trees. You have to look at the trees if you're going to find a nest. Look for pairs. Not always. Uh, completely accurate for this one, but it is very important that there are usually two birds to form a pair that are going to nest and then rear offspring. And then six is courtship and copulation. This is the final step leading to the actual um, next generation of birds. So know the species you're looking for. What environment do they prefer? What type of nest do they build? Are their offspring altricial or precocial? So moving across these images, we've got uh, cliff swallows on the left that have built these uh, mud daubed houses on the eve of a barn. So clearly they need to have easy access to this mud to build it if they have to fly three miles in each direction with just a little beak load of mud to build this complex structure. It's going to take far too long. They're going to be done with the nest by the time the season's over. So they have to have easy access to that. They have to have uh, easy access to an open area where they can feed and forage since they are mainly insectivores and they feed from the wing. In that center image, we have a sandhill crane nest. Uh, sandhill cranes lack their hollocks, their uh, big toe or their back toe on birds is rotated backwards. The Because of that, they can't perch on trees, so they have to nest on the ground. And it's a fairly simple nest. It's just reeds and grasses that are turned into a mound. And then the female will typically lay on it during the day where the male will take it at night. And then it's placed in fairly shallow water, maybe less than a foot deep, uh, usually 
significantly less than that, uh, just so that way they don't get aquatic predators to come towards it, especially alligators for Florida. Um, and uh, it still gives them an early warning system for any kind of uh, mammal predator, like a raccoon or a bobcat or a fox that's trying to sneak up and steal from the nest. And then the far right is an Arctic tern. They don't produce or build any nests, so they just lay the egg in the sand and then incubate it directly from there. The problem with that is this bird, we don't know if it's resting or if it's nesting, but based on the time of the year, it's uh, June in Alaska, there's a fairly good chance that it is uh, a nesting bird. So our first example uh, of this is the tree swallow. And again, moving left to right on these images, uh, the range map here, just in case if you don't know the colors of the map, the blue is wintering or non-breeding uh, season. So Cuba, Mexico, Central America, the Gulf Coast uh, states, a little bit of California, Arizona, and pretty much all of Florida, and a little bit up into the East Coast. That's where the uh, tree swallows are coming for the winter to get away from the cold up north. Yellow is migratory route. So they are just really passing through there. Uh, and then the orange red is where their breeding season is. So that's where they're going and actually nesting uh, during the spring. And the middle shot is uh, two juvenile birds. They're probably, the photo was taken in late June. So they are probably uh, from the beginning of the nesting season. So uh, very brand new birds still learning how to really fly. And then on the right, that is a breeding pair on a nest box. And the male is on the left, the female is on the right. You can tell a little bit of a difference in the intensity of the blue on the two birds. Males are a little bit um, brighter. The females are a little bit more drab, not as drastic as some other species, but there's definitely some uh, dimorphism there. So tree swallows are secondary cavity nesters. So that nest box we have is simulating a, a cavity nest, so a woodpecker hole or just a natural cavity. They prefer open, tall grassland environment, just like those um, cliff swallows from earlier. They are a insectivore that hunts on the wing, so they need to be able to make those maneuvers. Egg laying depends on the range. So in the south, it's mid-April, so you see kind of the uh, northern, southeastern states, Tennessee, uh, some of the Carolinas, and Kentucky, and then in the north it's may to june so that's alaska in um, canada where it's taking a little bit longer for those frosts to finally uh, give to spring the monk parakeet is going to be our second example so on the range map here we have purple which is different color so these are resident populations you can see central to southern florida a little bit in the north atlantic coast of florida probably saint augustine jacksonville zone um, couple sporadic spots in Texas, Mississippi, one in uh, Illinois, and then another small patch in the tri-state area um, in New Jersey, New York, and Connecticut. So monk parakeets make these uh, colonial stick nests, and you can see that in the other two images. Um, the center image is from Orlando, and then the um, image on the right is from St. Petersburg, Florida. And both of them, they're very high structures where the birds can see virtually everything around them. There's nothing taller than this. And that's what they would do naturally in uh, Central and South America, where they would find the tallest trees that they could, make a big bundle colonial stick nest, and be able to be protected from anything that would try and sneak up on them. Uh, these are resident populations, like I said. Uh, so they will uh, nest and breed throughout the year. Uh, if weather permitting in Florida, perfectly fine. We, especially South Florida, tropical climates all the time, shouldn't be a problem. And then egg laying is dependent on the uh, latitude of the population. So in Florida, like I just said, perfectly fine to nest whenever. It, it's not really going to matter too much, especially the further south you get. But if we have that population in, it looks like Chicago, it's going to be very dependent on those winters. Now these Stick nests are uh, very well insulated, so that's why they can survive in Chicago. But just because they can survive there doesn't mean that they can still nest and have enough food for the growing um, parakeets. So this is a precocial 
example, so these are common gallinules, uh, precocial means essentially when the bird is hatched, it is ready to run. So if you think of like a horse where it's born a couple minutes later, it's up on its feet, a couple minutes after that, it's starting to walk around and then running shortly after that. So very, very well developed right out of the gate. Uh, the little bird in the middle has some food in its mouth. The parents are teaching it what to eat. It still needs parental help, but it is already very independent. And then old trishal is where the bird is extremely dependent on the parents for food and for protection. So these are uh, house finches. There's still a little egg you can see on the right side. And then there's those three chicks that are there. So think of it as like... Um, a puppy or a kitten where they come out very, very vulnerable. Same thing with birds, uh, but these do have a very quick um, growing life. So the key behaviors to spot, first one is to watch for nesting material being gathered and the actual construction of nests. So with the fish crow in the bottom left photo, it's carrying branches, perfect example of carrying nesting material. Uh, consistently seeing a bird fly off with food in its beak, the American robin in the center, that's got a beak full of worms. If it's carrying that many worms, it's definitely feeding something, uh, whether that's a gift to another uh, bird or for as a pair bond uh, gift, or if it's to feed offspring, can't be 100% sure until you see it, but it's definitely not for it, and that's a good cue that there's nesting going on. And then you've also got mobbing larger or predatory birds. So the American kestrel and the red-shouldered hawk are giving us a perfect example of that on the right, where the kestrel is dive bombing the hawk and screaming at it. It's trying to scare the hawk away. Uh, most likely has a nest very close to where this is happening. It doesn't want the hawk to know where the nest is, and it doesn't want the hawk to raid the nest. And then another one is quick and quiet flight into a particular area. So say you have a uh, Northern Cardinal, it's singing in the top of a pine tree on one side of uh, this park, and then it flies over to another wooded section of the park, and it's dead quiet, not making a single sound, flies back over to the pine tree again, starts calling again, most likely where it flew into, there's a nest, or there's something that it doesn't want other birds to know about. So that's a good cue to start looking in that area if you are looking for the nest for that cardinal. So nest building, here we've got a pair of osprey. So these guys are building a big platform nest in the crook of that tree. This is a Carolina wren, and we've got a um, cropped in superimposed shot of the spider that it caught. And so, um, like I was saying, the invertebrates are very, very important for birds during the nesting season. It's part of why we have spring. And if you go outside now, you'll see dragonflies and all kinds of insects all over the place. And that's crucial for the birds because hatchlings, their diet is 99% insect based or um, should say invertebrate race because this is not an insect. Um, so they have to have a good supply of this food if they're going to hatch in time for, uh, or fledge in time for the summer and for migration. And then here we've got mobbing again. So obviously the black belly whistling duck has no threat to the common grackle that's attacking it, but the grackle sees it's a larger bird. It could have flown a little too close to the nest. It could have uh, buzzed the tree that the nest is in. Could be any number of reasons why the grackle's attacking the duck. But regardless, it's giving it a message of you need to back off. You're too close. Uh, that kind of thing. So next is we listen. So hatchlings will beg for food. Uh, that begging will is designed to attract the parent so that they know to feed it. The American robin chick on the left, that was in a bush. It was begging nonstop, so it made it fairly easy to spot. And the downy woodpecker on the right, you can see actually a little bit of saliva between its beak and the hatchling that's inside of that little hole. Uh, so she was feeding it, and we were uh, trying to spot where this uh, noise was coming from. We kept seeing the woodpecker flying into it, so we figured that was the hatchling's begging. So young birds will also practice their songs. If you're walking around at night and you're hearing this kind of soft uh, kind of whispering songs that are going out, especially in some larger trees, most likely that's a young bird or an inexperienced bird 
practicing its song. So they'll practice their rep repertoire at night while there's no competition or no threat of them um, making the presence known to a predator or to a rival of the same species. So with the cardinal, again, if we have a young cardinal that's singing, it could attract a adult cardinal from a different area that could think it's a uh, competition and that could cause problems. So they practice at night. It's very soft. It's a very, very fun thing to, to witness. And then parents won't sing near the nest, just like with the previous example, that quick, quiet flight. If they're very silent in a specific zone, there's most likely a nest fairly close. So we've got two birds. We've got the northern mockingbird on the right and the red-bellied woodpecker on the left. Sorry, vice versa. Mockingbird on the left, woodpecker on the right. The Both of them are begging. You can see it here. And you can see, actually, on the mockingbird fairly well that mouth. The color of the mouth is another aid for the parent to know where to feed the bird. Um, but both of them being as noisy as they were, it makes it very easy to spot where these young birds are. So inspecting trees, uh, skin branches for cup nests, look in the crook of branches for stick nests, search for cavity nests, and then look for white droppings. So the photo on the left, that's a bald eagle nest. They prefer to open or make their nests in open branches just below the canopy. The canopy will act as a shade for the hatchlings during the day and also protects them from some rain. Um, that's in Georgia, uh, but the, those nests can get very, very large, so they can be fairly easy to spot, which is uh, very nice. The middle nest is a small cup nest made by a blue-gray gnatcatcher, and it's maybe half the size of the palm of your hands. Very, very, very small. And what they'll do is they'll add these little pieces of lichen and moss onto the exterior of it, and it will make it camouflage extremely well. So it's very hard to spot. But if you're watching for the gnatcatcher flying in and out of the nest, it then, then does become a little bit easier. And then on the far right, it's a owl box with a barn owl in it. And you can see the top of the head of the owl there. And that you can see the white droppings. That's uric acid. And so it's a really good indicator if of just activity in general. If you've got lots of droppings at the base of a tree, you know that's a good perch that something likes. Um, but if you can see that on the edge of a nest box, if on the edge of a cavity nest at the base of a tree, it's really covered, that's a really good indicator that you have an active nest site. So this is one for scanning. So this is a great horned owl. It's not a very good shot, but a uh, great horned owl, uh, adult with two uh, hatchlings. And it took about 20 minutes of scanning this tree to find them because they're completely still. They're not moving at all. And they are the exact same shade as this pine tree. I zoomed in a little bit better. You can see the face of the uh, young owl the owlet up in the front the other owlet you can't really see its face too well and then the adult is directly behind that uh chick so then look for pairs it's primarily for less social species so raptors are a really good indicator on this hawks kites falcons uh, they don't tend to spend a lot of time with each other not very social uh birds so if you do see them being together more often then that's a very good indicator Dimorphic species are a good sign. Again, dimorphism is where you can tell the difference between a male and a female. Uh, like, if, for example, a wood duck. Male wood ducks are stunning, very, very beautiful, tons of color. Female wood ducks, they've got some color, but they're a lot more drab. So that is an example of dimorphism. And then it's, this isn't necessarily a dead giveaway. So the bald eagles on the right are the reason for that. Uh, bald eagles have extremely good pair bonds in the last decades and they'll stay together pretty much the entire period of time so if you see a pair of eagles that doesn't necessarily mean that they are currently nesting they could be during the off season where they're just hanging out with each other waiting to fly back up uh, or it could be that they do have an active nest so take it with a grain of salt depending on the species it's a good indicator sometimes a little bit less so so specifically with this one uh two mississippi kites um this is a very good indicator. They're semi-social where they will hunt in loose groups if there's a lot of prey. Uh, there's one time I've seen about a dozen of these uh, all hunting dragonflies over a pasture. 
with no problem with each other. None of them were interacting aggressively to another bird. But the majority of the time, they're very um, independent. They, you don't see too many of them being very close. And two birds like that being this close to each other definitely is a sign that this is a pair. And then courtship and copulation. So watch for pair engaging in courtship displays. This could be dancing, duets, gift giving, and etc. So the sandhill cranes that are at the bottom le left there, they are in the process of doing their dancing ritual. So one crane will grab a clump of dirt or a piece of vegetation, toss it up in the air to initiate the dance. And then they will bow to each other, jump, flash their wings, and go through a whole process of um, of doing this display. And it's a really, really fascinating display to watch. And it's done throughout the year, but it's especially common to see it during the um, migration back north during the spring to rebuild and to establish those pair bonds before they get to the, the breeding site. And then copulation often occurs at or near the nest. So if you see copulation happen, that's very likely that they're not far at all from the nest site. Um, the birds aren't stupid. They're not going to waste energy on producing eggs and the time and the effort that it's going to take to have a successful uh, clutch. And if they don't have a nest, they're not going to have a successful clutch. clutch. So they won't uh, copulate up until that point. So this is a pair of sandhill cranes doing a duet. The male will typically lead in the duet, followed by the female. And then there's a slight difference in the tone in that call. And again, it's a way to build pair bonds and to signal to other cranes. This is gift giving, where the red shouldered hawk on the right gave a, a some form of lizard, probably an anole, to the hawk on the left as they're trading posts on the nest. So likely in the process of incubating some eggs, uh, came back to the nest with lunch and then took over. And then here we've got a pair of great horned owls just after copulation. So definitely going to have outlets in this area coming very soon, but um, very good indicator that there's a nest nearby. So what do we do when we find a wild nest? Um, don't pin the nest. Uh, you don't want to put a direct pin on the nest just because it's a very sensitive thing for the birds. Um, you want to give it a respectful amount of distance. The way that I always think of it is you don't want to have someone peeking in your windows. It's not fair to you if someone does that to you so it shouldn't be fair to do that to the birds either um the birds that we have here it's a red mass parakeet um a red cockaded woodpecker and an eastern screech owl the parakeets and the owl are from the same park it was actually really convenient that they were uh just a couple of trees apart from each other so this is in miami in april and uh it's hot so there's a little stone fence that I sat on and photographed these guys while I was in the shade. So I was probably 75 yards away from them taking these photos. They're still very good photos. So I have nothing to complain about. The parakeets, why they're out of the nest there, because there's a family that wasn't paying enough attention to what was going on. And they walked directly underneath that nest tree. And so it triggered the parakeets to think that they're going to come to attack their tree and they get into a defensive display. So one-offs like that aren't going to make or break their success. However, repeated uh, offenses of it could cause them to abandon that nest site. So that's one of the reasons why you don't want to pin the nest. If you have a ton of people going to it, or if they're playing calls, to try and draw out the uh, hatchlings to the edge of it to get the really cute photo of the little baby bird, uh, it might stress out the parents to where they just abandon the nest and then they fail. So you don't want to do that. The red cockaded woodpeckers, that was in the Ocala National Forest. Um, they're fairly well known where they're at. Um, even still, you don't want to pin exactly where they are, or which tree they're in. Um, and if you see the activity, just find a good spot to sit down and make yourself still and then just let the birds do their thing and they'll they'll give you good opportunities to to view and photograph them uh so if you're posting onto ebird if you're posting photos then this is what you can do to help give more data to 
other birders as well as uh, Cornell. So this is at Lake Apopka a couple of weeks ago, and there's great blue herons nesting there like crazy. And so I got this shot of a uh, baby heron begging for food from this parent. So great blue herons aren't dimorphic. So in the section for age and sex, I don't know if it's a male or a female, so just do the unknown. And then we do have two uh, hatchlings there. So we do two juveniles for a uh, sex unknown as well, because we can't tell what they are. Uh, in the behaviors, we can put feeding young. That's the behavior that's going on here. And then the tags, uh, we have nest because they're actively at the nest. And now from the basic eBird standpoint, um, on the right, we have the app view. Now this is Android. If it's slightly different on um, uh, Apple, I don't know but I believe they are virtually identical. And then on the left is gonna be the website view of the uh, eBird. So same thing here, you can add your uh, breeding codes. So in this case, it's nest with young, but if you have one where, like with that Robin from earlier carrying food, you could do CF, and then you can have that uh, breeding code as well. So whatever it is, you can make sure that you have your um, your correct code while you're doing your birding as well as after the fact when you're back home going through your photos or just verifying what you saw. So then how you, can you help? So volunteering with Marion Audubon, uh, we're always happy to have other people come out and learn about birds with us. You can find and ethically monitor local uh, sites. So if you find a nest, you can go through different sources and uh, monitor it. And then you can also set up a nest box. It's a really good way to get incorporated and understand uh, different birds and how they nest, the seasons of when nesting is and the stages of bird development. So it's another really good way to get into birding in a different dimension of it. So nest monitoring programs with Marion Audubon Society are the American uh, Kestrel nest, nest Boxes, Bald Eagle Nest Monitoring, Eastern Bluebird Nest Boxes, and then some other organizations are the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. They have Nest Watch as their program. And then the Purple Martin Conservation Association Project Martin Watch is a little bit of a mouthful. So the American Kestrel Nesting, there's a little information on the kestrels themselves. So they are secondary cavity nester. Uh, the hole typically faces uh, northwest and it's usually between 10 to 30 feet high. Uh, the nesting period is from March, late March to early July. They have up to five eggs per clutch. A clutch is the number of eggs that they lay at a time. One to two broods per year. Broods are the number of clutches that they have. And then incubation is 26 to 32 days. Nesting is 28 to 31 days. Uh, and they do perform biparental care with a loose site fidelity. And what that means is that you have two parents providing care for the chicks. So in the case of the photo on the right, it's the male on the exterior of the cavity and the female on the interior. The male was passing off, it looks like a grasshopper, uh, to the female who's most likely incubating at this time. And then the site fidelity means how likely are they to return to the same cavity nest in subsequent years. So it's possible that this pair will come back to this hole again, but it's not certain that they will. It's it's just as likely that they'll go and find a different cavity nest and nest there as they would to go to this one. And so for our nest watch that we do, uh, we work with Florida Fish and Wildlife Conservation and Research Institute. Uh, our observations this year began on March 26th. That's where that photo on the bottom right is. And we have nest boxes at the Ocala Regional Sportsplex, Big Sun Soccer, the Ocala Wetlands uh, Recharge Park. That's the next nest box at the top right, Tuscawilla and Legacy Parks. So far, one out of seven of them has eggs. Again, that's the one that's in the picture on the right. And if you're interested in volunteering, uh, you can contact Marion Audubon at Outlook.com or just shoot me an email and uh, we can get you out there and learning about kestrels. So this is a kestrel box and uh, all the links for the different um, uh, organizations and information that I have throughout this uh, program are going to be at the very end and I can link them into the chat at the end as well. So this is available from FWC. 
And there's a couple of interesting parts to, to look at here. So the first one is that entry hole with a three inch diameter um, hole. You want to make sure that you're following the directions of the sizing of it. If it's too small, the birds aren't going to fit in there and they're not going to come to your nest box. If they're too large, then you're going to have the option of other species that can get in there too. So instead of a kestrel box, you might have a screech owl box. So keep that in mind. You've also got drain holes and uh, ventilation holes on here too. So you need to have good airflow for these birds, especially for Florida. It gets hot inside this box. It's going to be like a little oven. Um, the drain holes are very important for any kind of waste or water that seeps in so that it can drain and they're not going to be, the nest is going to be sitting in a puddle. Um, and then the other part is you have that slanted roof. And this goes into with the rain as well, where if it rains, when it rains really for Florida, uh, that rain is going to shed off of the roof and then fall rather than pooling and then eventually seeping into the box. So bald eagle nesting, uh, they have large stick nests in trees or tall structures. Their nesting period really depends on the range. Um, in the northern range, it's in March to July. In the southern range, it's October to May. Uh, by northern and southern here, uh, northern means Alaska and Canada. Southern is going to be mostly the contiguous U.S., so pretty much the whole rest of the United States. They have one to three eggs per clutch, only one brood per year. Incubation for eagles is 34 to 36 days, so significantly longer than the kestrel. And then the nesting period is way longer at 56 to 98 days. So they are much larger birds than kestrels, so it takes a lot longer for them to become fledged for when they can leave the nest. Again, they have biparental care and they have a high sight fidelity this time. So instead of the kestrels where they may or may not come, it's almost a guarantee that if you have an active eagle nest in an area, they will come back in the following year. So Audubon Eagle Watch, um, there's a link to it. There are currently 709 volunteers monitoring 1,674 nests across the state of Florida. If you have an eagle nest, report it. Uh, the blue dots are monitored by Audubon, and the red dots are by uh, citizen scientists, so just average birders that are entering information into uh, Audubon's uh, database. So specifically for Florida bald eagles, the stages are nesting begins in October, egg laying is from December to January, blood, or hatchlings are from February to March, and then fledglings are April to May. So we're entering into that fledgling state right now. Uh, so if you have an eagle nest, make sure you're going out and checking it. Uh, if you haven't already done a report on it, make sure you do. You can get in touch with eaglewatch at audubon.org or either of the emails from earlier. We're happy to help you get in touch with the people that need to know about this stuff. Uh, next, we have the Cornell Lab of Ornithology Nest Watch. Nestwatch.org. So it's essentially the eBird version for nest monitoring. Uh, so you select your species, the location description of your nest, and then it also provides you information on setting up nest boxes. Uh, it keeps records of previous recordings, and it really provides some vital data to researchers and to Cornell themselves. Um, this is also where you can become certified as a nest watcher. So before you're allowed to enter any inf information, you're required to uh, take a, a short course and a quiz. By the end of that, if you pass, you'll get a certificate saying that you are certified as a nest watcher, and then you can start adding your information in there. And there's also the app. So just like eBird and like Merlin, um, you have an app for nest watch. So you don't have to do it on your computer. You can very easily switch from eBird to nest watch. If you find a nest, plug in the information for it and then submit that. So the Purple Martin Conservation Project Martin Watch it's a designed to research purple martin populations um, strictly through citizen science, not strictly, mostly citizen science, but definitely some professionals as well. Um, scout arrival study provides information on changing migratory patterns. It's, we can see when different um, areas have seen their martins first and uh, when that uh, arrival is changing. They perform banding, uh, geolocators, and GPS tracking for purple martins. This is also where you can get purple martin colony complexes uh, from uh, PMCA. And then there's a link to their 
uh, organization as well. So this is a Purple Martin uh, colony. And there's a couple of things to note on here. The uh, you So the bird that is not sitting right, that's a decoy. So that's designed to make the Martins find and discover these nests a lot faster so they can establish their nest quickly, as quickly as they can when the season starts. So it's not an injured bird. It's plastic. It's perfectly fine. Uh, the nest boxes themselves are a very interesting shape. They're shaped like gourds. It's a requirement for the purple martins. And if you look, you've got a little uh, screw cap on the uh, right side of the boxes. That's for when uh, researchers or uh, volunteers are there. They can pop it out and they can look inside of the nest box without disturbing anything in it to see the status of the eggs or the hatchlings or if it is an active nest or not. And if you look on the pole, you can see a little uh, pulley system where uh, there's a cable connected to that series of nests that can be lowered and make it even easier for the researchers to gain access to those nests. So very well designed uh, system, uh, very fun to watch the Purple Martins fly in and out of it with uh, dragonflies. So Eastern Bluebird nesting. Uh, this is going to be a secondary cavity nester as well. Uh, the hole typically will face the east, and they can have nest holes anywhere between 4 to 50 feet. They are not too picky. Uh, the nesting period is from March to July, and they'll have 4 to 7 eggs per clutch. The typical is 5 to 6, but there are outliers on either side. And they'll have 1 to 3 broods per year. And again, there's outliers as far as some have had four broods. It just depends on the amount of food and the how quickly they started in the season. Uh, incubation is only 11 to 19 days, so very quick turnaround. And then nesting is, again, very fast at 17 to 18 days. So they're less than two weeks after they've hatched, the little birds are flying. So that's why having a good source of insects and being in spring, having that is so vital for these birds. Again, by parental care, male and female both take care of it. And they have a moderate site fidelity, but it's very high for subsequent broods. So what that means is that they will come to the same house pretty frequently each year but in the same year if they had a successful brood then or successful clutch rather then they'll stay in that same house or the same cavity until the season's over and then they'll leave so um slight differences between the three birds that we've talked about so should you make or buy a bluebird box uh, bluebird boxes are pretty much available anywhere that bird feeders are they're fairly inexpensive uh so if you don't want to uh, take the time or you don't have the tools to build it, you can absolutely buy one. There's nothing wrong with that. Uh, Audubon does offer guides and blueprints on how to build a Bluebird box. And some of the, just the really uh, basic things uh, to touch on if you do uh, build, don't use treated wood. Use untreated wood. The chemicals that are in that can really harm the birds. Uh, it can damage the uh, eggs. It could damage the hatchlings. Just use standard wood. The Audubon talks about the different types of wood that you can use that will uh, hold up a lot better than just some plywood or something. So just make sure you're using untreated wood. Entrance hole for bluebirds is one and a half inches in diameter. So half the size of the kestrel. Uh, again, you want to be paying attention to your um, entrance hole diameters. It's very important to limit what species are allowed in the boxes. Uh, the box itself is five and a half by five and a half uh, wide and long, and then it's nine inches tall. So it's it's a decent sized box, not too big, not too small, but it's just enough for uh, the nest and for the nestlings in it. And the nest boxes should be attached to a pole with a predator guard attached. So predator guard is a, or it's also called a predator baffle. It's essentially like the cone of shame for a dog after they've had a, a surgery, except it's can be plastic, it can be metal, it can be a number of different materials, but the cone opening faces down. And so that prevents squirrels or anything from really climbing up that pole. And this is really important for snakes, uh, especially in raccoons. Raccoons are very smart and they can get around a lot of different um, problems. But if you get a good quality baffle for them and for snakes, they're not going to get past that. And both, both of those animals love bird eggs. So the more we can prevent that from being in their diet, the better. Uh, here's a link to Amazon for 
Bluebird House, 22 bucks. Prime says you can get it in one day. Uh, almost 4,000 people say it's really good. So very accessible, very affordable. So there's uh, if you want to get into Bluebird boxes, by all means, do it. So once you get your Bluebird box, where should you set it up? So like all real estate, it's location, location, location. The surrounding area should be very open grassland or pasture with scattered trees, um, similar to the swallows that we had at the beginning of this presentation bluebirds are almost entirely insectivores and they like to hunt on the wing as well they're not uh obligate to it they don't have to only hunt on the wing but they do like catching those flying insects so they like to it's called sallying where they fly out from a perch capture their prey and then fly back to a perch so that's where the scattered trees are good for them hide in the shade get away from predators um that is an important feature for their environment when you're setting up the Bluebird box, try and do it between four to 10 feet just for your own sake. You can, if you want to put it at 50 feet up, but it's going to be hard to get to that with a ladder. Uh, so if you have it between four to 10, you can reach it just with nothing or with a little step stool. So you should be fine there. The entrance hole faces east towards the open space. So the parent can very easily leave the nest quickly grab some food and then fly back. So another important feature for a bluebird nest. Additional boxes should be spaced 20 feet apart. Um, if you're gonna make multiple colonies, they should be about 300 feet apart, um, just to so there's not too much uh, or work going on in one area. But if it's 20 feet apart for two or three boxes, that's perfectly fine. Ensure clean food and water are easily accessible. You might have to put out a bird bath if you don't have a good water source. Um, don't put it too close to the nests, though. Uh, the birds are smart enough that they'll figure out where the water is. Um, and you don't want to have your nest boxes too close to feeders either. Um, the feeders are going to introduce other species to come to the area. It could introduce uh, brown-headed cowbirds into that uh, zone, and they could try to plant a couple of their eggs into a bluebird nest, and then you could have a problem with that. So keep a good space between your nest box and your um, feeders. If you can, try and put it on opposite sides of the property, but make sure that there's good spacing on those. Check the nests weekly. You want to have consistent reports from your nest so you can have good data from uh, what you have there. And then you can also clean out old nesting material after the first brood or the second brood has fledged. Um, once they've fledged, bluebirds have been, there's been some research on it to show that they actually prefer to have a cleaned out uh, nest box once the uh, brood is done, because then they can restart, build an, a new cup nest, and then lay new eggs. Uh, the nest can get pretty messy, so it reduces the risk of parasites, it reduces the risk of disease for the hatchlings, so it's just a general uh, good step to have. And then houses should be up by February in the southeast. So unfortunately for us, um, our period is more or less done. Uh, we've already started to see some uh, fledglings coming out. So it's a really good sign, but it does mean if you put a bluebird house out now, you most likely are going to get skipped over. You could get other species that come in and use it uh, for the latter part of the season. But this does give you plenty of time to get all your materials, get certified on uh, Nest Watch, and then get everything set up by the winter so they can get comfortable with it. And then by February, they're starting to build their nests. So who else uses bluebird uh, houses? So essentially, any other secondary cavity nester will take advantage of it. Uh, cavity nests are fairly infrequent in the wild, um, especially unused ones. So whenever one pops up, a bird will take it. Um, bluebirds prefer nesting with smaller neighbors. Uh, those are titmice, wrens, nuthatches. Swallows and flycatchers are a little bit on the bigger side, but they don't compete directly for most of their food. So they're typically pretty fine. So we've got that tree swallow in the top right. And changing the size of that entry hole can control what species use of the box. So again, if you have too big of a hole, say it's a two inch hole, you can now have a larger, potentially more powerful and aggressive bird take over. The bluebird's not gonna have a chance against it. 
If it's too small, if it's a one inch hole, it's too small for the bluebirds. They're not going to be able to get into the nest at all. So make sure that your nest hole is the proper size. And then if you have woodpeckers that are trying to drill it out to make it bigger, uh, you can add different uh, wood stacks on top of that to repair the entry hole as well. And be wary of uh, house sparrows and European starlings. The house sparrow on that bottom right image, they'll take over bluebird nests like crazy. Um, they'll even rip apart bluebird nests and, and place their own eggs in it and take over a box. So they're an invasive species. Um, they're taking over from native species. We don't need that. Uh, and so the whole point of putting out these bluebird nests, or the boxes rather, is to help uh, give their population a better chance of success. So then why is nest monitoring important? Uh, it gives us hard data on nest success rate. Uh, it gives us a better understanding of what species nest in certain areas, and then it gives us some measurable patterns and changes in nesting time. So if we have a location where we've seen, um, save that red-headed woodpecker, where we've seen this red-headed woodpecker nest consistently, then there's new development going on, and we start losing that habitat for the red-headed woodpecker, then we can know if it moved to a new location, if it's completely abandoned and moved to somewhere else, or what the case is for that bird. It also changes with uh, the amount of time in the year, if they're nesting earlier or later. Um, so it's it's all very important information. And that's it for the presentation. So thank you. And if anyone has any questions, we can take them now. And then here's all the links. And I'll get these over into the chat too. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen. All right. Thank you so much. That was insanely informative. That was awesome. Oh, you're welcome. It's my pleasure. And let me do. There you go. All those links are now in the chat. All right. I'm going to stop recording.